I'd like to introduce our first speaker. We have Kate Locke, who is a Marine Conservation Officer for National Resources Wales. She has spent 25 years working for Natural Resources yeah. Wales at the Scoma Marine Conservation Zone, where annually, annually she conducts the grey seal surveys alongside long-term diving and seashore monitoring projects. Kate is the Sea Search Project Coordinator for South and West Wales. Have your ears ready and open and eyes on the go for Kate's story to the sea as she shares with us her wealth of experience. Okay, Prim on Dow. Hello, I'm Kate Locke. Um, I hope you can all see my screen okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Grey Seals Wanderers of the Irish Sea. So in this first picture here, we can see um, a grey seal. This is a cow, um, absolutely beautiful there in the sunshine. The Latin name for seals is, or for the grey seals, is Halicurus gripus, which is a Greek name, and it means sea pig with hooked nose. Uh, the Welsh name is Morlo, which I think is a lovely name. So. Okay, in Wales, we predominantly get the grey seal, but occasionally we get a rare visitor of what's called the harbour seal, or otherwise known as the common seal. The name common comes because it's the most common in the world, but in the UK, it's not as um, frequently found as the grey seal. These are mainly found up in Scotland, um, in the UK, but we do occasionally get a, a wanderer that comes down to Pembrokeshire, um, or sorry, to the, to the Welsh coast. So the grey seals you can see here on the right, much thicker set, wider neck, much longer, sort of more Roman type nose, while the common seal, the harbour seal, has a much smaller face, a little bit prettier. Um, it's a smaller seal generally and is quite speckly. Um, so do keep your eyes out for that one um, because it's always good to, to know about the sightings. So a few grey seal facts. The grey seals can spend 80% of their time underwater. OK, they, they breathe hold up to 20 minutes at a time, which is quite phenomenal. They can dive up to 100 metres of depth and they use their fantastic whiskers, which are hypersensitive, to pick up vibration trails of their prey. They can also sleep in the water. They often do this what, with, with something we call bottle nosing, where they literally tip their nose out of the surface of the water, the rest of the body is submerged, and they literally bop along, almost floating upright. And, um, you know, as I say, it's called bottle nosing because of it, the way it mimics a bottle on the surface of the water. But they also haul out on rocks, and we often see them, um, especially on sort of remote rocks um, in the offshore island areas. They come to shore in the autumn to give birth to their pups. And seals, they, they don't tend to hang out in groups um, most of the year or when they're out at sea, they're very much individuals. But it's in the autumn that we'll get the congregations of the seals back to shore um, so they can give birth. So here we have fantastic seal cow. Um, the cow's the name for the female um, seals. And here she's given birth to her pup. She'll come ashore every, well, up to five to six times a day, maybe more often, depending on how much she likes to attend her pup, um, to feed. And it's super, super rich um, milk, um, almost like clotted cream. Okay, Much of the time, the seals will be seen alone on the beaches. They're absolutely fine. They hang out there. That's where they sleep. And the cow often chooses to head back in the water. She's never far away. She just likes floating around the water because that's where she feels a lot more comfortable. So I work at the SCOMA Marine Conservation Zone and here we um, conduct um, quite an intense survey, a very detailed survey of our grey pups and this is the one way we can look at um, how the population is doing in general. So we track each individual seal pup from when it's born through to when it molts and this takes only three weeks. Um, some um, it, it can happen quicker than that as well. So the pups are born new on the beaches. They have this fluffy white coat. And as you can see, this one, its, it's coat is too big for it. It's got very little um, uh, coordination skills. It's very floppy and it has this big baggy coat. But very quickly, being fed by the cow, it starts putting on weight and it starts getting very good head coordination. And this just takes five days. So between five and 10 days, we call this a class two pup with this kind of um, shape. As the seal pup gains more weight, 
the neck itself starts disappearing and it starts forming this very fat round torpedo shape um, in its body. This is the time when they're very inactive, they tend to sleep a lot. So they're basically feeding, sleeping, feeding, sleeping, conserving their energy. And slowly, about after about uh, two weeks plus, they'll start their molting. So this lovely white coat where they're looking very cute starts to come off in big handfuls and they'll roll around while it's all itchy. Um, and finally, we'll reveal their new waterproof pelage. And this is our class five pups. This takes on average around 18 days. It can be a little bit less, a little bit more. But at this stage, the cow stops feeding the pup. It's now abandoned as such, or it's, it's left to its own devices. And now this new seal pup needs to start venturing out to sea, feeding itself, resting, hiding, and basically um, getting through that first winter. It does have good resources. It's got lots of fat reserves and it's got this wonderful pelt. So how are the seals doing? Generally, we've been seeing an increase in seals in Wales. And we can see this by looking at our long-term data. So this survey we've been doing at SCOMA ha is um, had the same effort um, and same method since 1992. So we can look at this long-term data set. If you look at the top line in gray here, you can see really from 90 through 92, right through to 2009, our average number of pups born was around 220 pups. But since 2009, we've actually had a slow increase. So gradually, this has been increasing. And this year, we hit our um, highest numbers ever, which is about 420 pups. So this steady increase we've seen over the last 12 years. So obviously, this is a good reflection of the health of the population at the moment. Um, Similar surveys are being done at Ramsey, North Pembrokeshire. We've got South Pembrokeshire sites as well that are, are surveyed and areas up in North Wales, Bardsey Island um, and some of the, the Skerries as well. So this general trend that is being observed at the different locations is an upward trend and showing that um, this feature of many of the SACs is actually currently in really good condition. So as the, as the cows have finished feeding the pups, she then comes straight into season. And here we have a bull seal. You can see it's large hooked nose and it's very, very thick set neck. So they, these guys are much, much bigger than the cows. And uh, this one's a real handsome beast. So what do the, what do the um, bulls do? So during the time that the cow's tending to its um, pup, the bull will basically be um, sort of um, hanging out in the water at the entrances of the bay and there, he is basically marking his territory. He'll be fending off and fighting any other bull seal that comes into that area. Because as each cow starts coming into season, having finished with its pup, he's there ready for breeding. And um, the most dominant bulls will have the larger, um, will basically attend the larger beaches. So we have some sites where we'll have um, anything up to 20, 30 pups born, and therefore the dominant bull will there or breed with that many cows. And um, other bulls will then attend other locations as well along the coast. So what's in it for the females? She's just given birth. She's just uh, lost all that weight. She's about 30% of her body weight is lost during that period. And now she's pregnant again. Um, so they have a very clever trick that they do. The egg, um, it's fertilized, but it then goes into what's called a delayed implantation into the womb. So there's about a three month period where the egg does not develop. And this means that as she gains weight and as she gains um, strength, um, the egg can then start developing and there's a nine month gestation period. So during the winter, following the um, seal pup, following the pupping season and the breeding season, so we're talking from any time from late October now right through to March, many of the seals will haul out on what we call haul out sites. And these are scattered all along the Welsh coast. So they're often on very secluded locations, um, as on some of the offshore islands, but also some of the sort of more secluded locations um, on the mainland coast as well. And they, here they'll um, lower their heart rates, they reduce their metabolism, they kind of go into a dormant um, hibernation, but it's not a full hibernation. But there's a lot of recovery at this stage, they're keeping out of the bulk of the you know, fierce weather as well, and they'll also molt um, their outer coat and start growing through a new fantastic uh, waterproof coat ready for when they head out to sea. So heading out to sea now, where do they go? That's one of the questions we don't know 
a lot about, or we didn't know until we started using satellite tags. So seals, as I said, they aren't, they don't hang out in groups. They're not particularly neighborly to each other. They don't share or play together particularly. They are real individuals. And these satellite tags here, these ones were fitted by Seal Mammal Research Unit, which is based up in um, St. Andrews University in, in um, Scotland. Um, these expensive units were stuck onto the back of a handful of um, our seals. And um, this was done from sites up in North Wales, also off Ramsey and Scoma. And these are the results of just 14 satellite tagged adult seals. Um, so here we can see incredible movement around the Irish Sea. And this is why I wanted to call the talk, The Wonders of the Irish Sea. Here you can see like this green individual here, probably tagged up here in North Wales. It's covering a whole area up here. So up to the Scottish um, coastline here around the Isle of Man and back down to the coast. Well, we have others that literally are migrating from Anglesey here down to Pembrokeshire as well, and even crossing down into Carmarthen Bay. So there's this huge migration here. We've got off the Irish coast and also down to Cornwall. So if this, if you can visualize this from just 14 seals, if you can imagine now 2000 adult seals in these waters, quite what the um, track patterning would look like for that. As um, Alex said, we've got our Pembrokeshire Marine SACs and grey seals are features of three of the SACs. So the Penthlean and Sarnow, Cardigan Bay, and also Pembrokeshire Marine. So the fact that the seals migrate, so maybe many of the seals are born, um, seal pups are born down here in Pembrokeshire, but as soon as they leave the shores and with the adults, they then migrate and they're moving around using all the weight waterways. So the whole coast of the Welsh, um, whole of the Welsh coast is, is, is very important for the seals. This tagging was done in 2019, and this is just tracking five individuals, both all um, tagged um, either at Scoma or Ramsey. And this had additional depth data as well. So two tags were used, one that could actually um, see the frequency that they were diving, um, how and how deep they were diving, and also obviously tracking where they were going. And as you can see, this yellow one, which was tagged here in, in Ramsey, um, had actually gone right across here, across Cardigan Bay, up to the Penthlean, up to Anglesey, and up further north as well. Other individuals like the pink one has just hung out here along the north sort of Pembrokeshire coast area. So there's huge variation about each individual. They really are individuals and they really are wanderers and they head out and do as they please. So what's the main threat to the seals? Weather can be an issue. When they're far out at sea, it's not a big issue. They, that's where they thrive, that's where they survive, that's where they're in good place. But if they're close to the shoreline, and that, um, or on the shores during the pupping season, that's when they're more vulnerable because when the waves crash in um, to the coast itself, they're going to be bombarded. So here we've got an example here with Stormophilia, which one uh, many of you will remember in 2017, it was on the 16th of October. And this date is important because what we've actually got here is this was actually quite late into the pupping season. So all the seal pups that would have been born in August and right through for the first two or three weeks at least of September, or most actually the whole of September, will have already pupped, they would have already um, got through to their class five stage, they'll already have their waterproof coast, and for many of them they'll be able to head out to sea where they're actually safer. So those ones were pretty well safe. So the, the seals that would have been impacted were the ones that are currently on the beaches at the time. So we had wave heights here recorded at 16 metres and wind speeds gusting over 110. And yes, the following morning, it was carnage on the shores. So sites close to or actually on the um, pupping sites, many of the beaches actually half disappeared. So the pebbles were all dragged away, but we had many dead pups around. So what does the, how does this affect our sort of numbers of survival? If we look here at our survival over the long term, so again from 90 through, uh, uh, 92 right through to current 2020, we can see that the normal fluctuations of seal pup survival is anything from 70 to 90%. So it's quite a variation. And we have quite a few dips. So here's our 2017 one, where we had the dip um, primarily because of stormophilia. Um, but what would be um, significant is if 
these kind of big storms that affect the population um, occurred every single year. But as we can see in the subsequent years here, we actually had good survival at 80% and no big storms. Remembering that every year our Welsh coast gets hit by the storms in autumn. So it just depends whether um, where the seals are, what the tides are doing, whether it's spring tides as well coinciding with the big storms and how frequently they're bombarding against the coast. But in general, we have around an 80% survival rate overall. Other threats, we have commercial fishing, netting. Netting is not good for anything out at sea other than fishing. So if it's um, netting has got um, uh, abandoned or has been broken off in some way and is discarded into the sea, then it's an issue of it's being trapped in all sorts. So everything from your boat propellers um, right through to entanglement for the seals. And each year um, in our SCOMA survey, we do um, photograph around 20 seal pups that have got um, evidence of uh, netting, whether it be monofilament or other netting or rope around the necks. And this can be persistent for several years. The um, seals don't tend to, well, we, we don't see the ones necessarily that have died, but they seem to survive over several years. And you can see this scarring um, year on year when, you, when we're photographing and trying to work out which ones are which. But it is an issue and um, something definitely to um, try and avoid. Rubbish is another problem. Okay, here we've got large polystyrene pieces and large rubbish, which directly won't be affecting this puppet. But all this will break down into microplastics. So slowly it's eroding away and becoming smaller. And we've had seal diet studies that have been conducted by um, students at universities, where here we've got a nice big seal feces, uh, which he had the pleasure then of um, sorting and sieving through. And the main idea was to look for the, what, what are the seals actually eating? So it's a seal diet study. So here we've actually got um, little bones, which are called utoliths. And each fish will have a unique shaped type of utolith, which is a, a bone from the ear. And therefore we can distinguish what type of um, fish the um, seal's been eating. Um, but more um, uh, alarming is the, is the fact that plastics were being found in the, in the feces too. So here we've got little bits of um, polythene plastic, but also these microplastics, which have broken down and now are in the seal diet. So it's a little worrying that um, our sort of top predators like this um, are definitely eating that. And it might be direct food, but it's also um, being passed down through what we call bioaccumulation. So um, many of these microplastics could be in the fish that then the seal is subsequently eating. So pollution, this is always a worry um, or worrying, especially if there's a large um, incident, particularly from oil tankers and such like. But there's also localised pollution from, from all boats. All boats use um, fuel, so we need to take care and make sure that we're not uh, polluting the waters directly. Um, and um, if oil does um, get onto seals, it clogs up their pelage. It doesn't make, um, it makes it pretty, um, pretty tough for the seal to survive. And here we can see this pup is actually trying to feed and it's probably taking in toxins because this will be affecting the milk as well. Fortunately, um, these incidences don't happen frequently. Um, and um, things like oil seals, but also um, um, other seals that need rescuing. We have fantastic service through the um, British Divers Marine Life Rescue that help all around the um, UK coast. Um, and the RSPCA are always alert and aware. Um, it's, it's, we have to obviously take care whether we have to intervene and actually do rescues, but when we do, um, the, the um, animals are taken up to the seal hospitals, which have fantastic facilities for taking care of the seals, cleaning them up, feeding them, getting them to healthy weight so they, they can be then returned to um, a shore very close to where they would have been rescued originally. Other disturbance is from boat users, um, especially when we're getting too close to potential haul out sites that seals like to use um, to rest. But fortunately, um, we have fantastic marine codes now um, that have been produced for all around the Welsh coast. These are just two examples, so the Pemich Marine Code and the Ceredigion Marine Code. And seals are protected by legislation. So, you know, by law, we cannot disturb them and we need to try and minimise our um, impacts on them. Um, and these codes are providing very excellent guidance 
um, to be able to minimize our um, disturbance to the seal. So it's worth getting very familiar with the codes. Um, some are in more detail. So here in Pembrokeshire, um, the zonation maps have been produced in particular for areas where many of the uh, marine animals, marine mammals are found, so seabirds, seals, cetaceans and the like. And clear um, sort of codes have been put in place where we have exclusion zones for seals and, and this can be colour coded. So it might be at different times of the year, different areas need to be avoided. This means that we can try, comfortably go out, we can enjoy, we can observe, we can see the seals, but we're avoiding going into the areas where we'll cause our most disturbance. There's also been a fantastic new website just developed. Um, I believe this came live in 2019 and um, it's called the Wild Seals website and it covers the whole of the coast of Wales. So here you can discover um, the different animals and different creatures that we find on our Welsh coast. We can see how we can enjoy those and go attend events and stuff. But we also have um, fantastic um, advice here through about how to respect um, the wildlife that we're observing. And there's some very cool videos that have been developed as part of this that are nice and simple, have clear instruction and give advice on how, again, to enjoy yourself, get out there, but also to respect and minimise your impact. The other kind of observers we have um, for seals is obviously during the seal popping season. This is the popular time that many people come to the coast and head out for walks to go and see what they can see off the beaches. Um, but we need to again provide advice on how to uh, minimise disturbance. So here some signages have now been developed and this has to be you know, positioned in clear places. Um, this is at my, my work at Martin's Haven and th we do have signs on our signboard here but the thing is people head down the lane and they don't look at there. So we have a, a temporary sign so if we do get a sign on the, uh, the seal actually on the beach we'll put this up in a prominent place where people actually heading down will view it immediately. So it's, it's got to be there in the immediate um, visual. And this means that people can safely stand in a place where they're not causing a disturbance, they're not heading down onto the beach itself, and people obviously can put their dogs on lead and, and watch from a distance. And we have seal watching materials as well. So these are um, leaflets that provide great information, funky facts, what you're going to see, how the seal pups might develop and stuff. So it enhances everyone's enjoyment about actually going and seeing the seals um, at the same time as um, meaning that um, you can do it safely and with care as well. Um, and currently, I understand that uh, the Wales MPA offices are working together to create an all Wales leaflet as well for seal watching. So that's me completed. Dioch, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Hello, thank you very much, Kate. Um, I think we now have a couple of moments before um, introducing Fionn. There are some questions that have come through to you, Kate. Um, she has asked, when you talk of pup survival, for how long do you mean? I, I've heard that only 10% last their first year. Okay, um, that's an interesting question. Our pup survival, we class as for when they've if they've grown through to a class five. So basically they have a chance now to leave the shore. So they survive that first period, if you like. What happens then when they head out to sea, um, we, we're not so sure about. Um, there have been um, some studies done tracking on um, pups. And this was actually done in the 50s, believe it. So 50s, 60s, 70s, when it was slightly different style of um, interaction was done. Um, where wardens used to throw blankets over them, catch them, and then ring them. And um, some, I think there was nearly 600 pups um, were ringed like this to be able to track and see where they went. And this was done in the old school style because we didn't have social media, we didn't have internet or anything like that. So it was a matter of, you know, sending in um, rings that were found all around the coast. And it was absolutely astonishing to see where the um, seal pups were actually traveling to. You know, there was um, records from off France and Ireland and stuff. And these were all ones that were tagged off the Pembrokeshire coast. So we do know that the, they do travel far. What percentage actually survived, we don't know. But we do know that because the overall population is increasing, there must be a reasonable percentage that are surviving through to adulthood to be able to start um, 
you know, breeding and um, giving birth to pups. So the fact that our, our population has increased um, is a reflection that, um, you know, sufficient are surviving through. Um, and that is world populations for you. So it's um, what we're looking at is the, the two ends of it. How many cows are actually giving birth? Is that increasing? And how many pups are being born? So we can only use these as indicators. Thank, thank you, Kate. Um, Susan's asked a question. Has your tracking identified any differences in the distance travelled by male or female seals? Um, the, yes, the, of those 14 um, that I showed, um, there was both um, cows and bulls tracked there. And actually, it, it, again, it just varied massively. So it wasn't like distinctively the bulls travelled further than the cows. Each one was such an individual. You had some pretty lazy bulls and you had some pretty you know, active cows and vice versa. So they really are individuals. And I often, when I often describe it, I often say it's a little like humans. You know, you get some that's, you know, you know, itchy and twitchy and like to travel lots and others who like to just stay close to home. And that's with both bull and, and cows. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one last question and then the remaining questions we'll save for the uh, Q&A session. Um, Elvin has asked, have you noticed any difference in still behaviour or dynamics at their breeding or hauling out sites due to the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions? Um, and he's added a bit further down, I think, saying what he actually means is, have they benefited from less disturbance from land or boat-based or boat -based disturbance? To, to be honest, it's, it's too early days to be able to show that. Um, because, and the problem is we aren't also out there to be able to see and observe either. Um, I think um, to be if I, the, the whole out, so these um, SCOMA wardens themselves came off the island in November and they are already reporting what their haul out's like. And to be honest, it's pretty average and it's, it's more of a reflection of the weather. So they will shift from bay to bay if the weather's prevailing or coming straight into that beach. So, you know, you know one day they might be 80 on one shore and actually two days later, suddenly half of them are shifted around the corner and all shifted to another bay. So they don't move around a lot, but there is natural movement anyway. Um, but it's more often the prevailing weather that will be most effective, especially because haul out is usually in the winter months when there isn't that much activity out in the water anyway. Um, as far as the, um, the seals actually during the, this, this year in the pupping season, I was, I was out doing the seal survey on the Marlowe's Peninsula and um, we did have amazingly calm, sunny weather throughout September and early October. And I was absolutely stunned at how many people are actually out doing seal watching. Um, and I think because people, especially local people, because we are still allowed to move around at the time um, and people couldn't go further afield, they were doing more things out at home based and out on the shores. And um, I was actually really, uh, it was really good to see so many younger people. So usually the demographic people in the late teens early 20s you don't see out on about hiking about so much but actually this last year there are a lot more people about um but I, they will i saw very very little seal disturbance itself well thank you kate um it's now time to uh we will uh, move on to um our next presenter i'll come back to you at the q a session kate <laughs> 